We want to take you now to Wilmington, Delaware, where President-elect Joe Biden is uh, delivering uh, remarks on national security and foreign policy challenges facing his administration. Let's listen in. The power that an individual or a small group can muster and the need for continuing vigilance across the board. I want to thank the police department in Nashville, particularly those five police officers who worked so quickly to evacuate the area before the explosion occurred, risking their own lives. And for all the firefighters and first responders who jumped into action early on that Christmas morning, last Christmas morning, their bravery and cool-headedness likely saved lives and prevented a worse outcome, and we are eternally grateful to that law enforcement agency. And uh, I know the hearts of all Americans are the people of Nashville as they rebuild and recover from this traumatic event. Now, Vice President Harris and I, along with our nominees to lead the national security institutions, have just been briefed by some of the professionals who have been conducting agency reviews as a part of our transition. This is a long-standing part of the orderly transition of power in American democracy. We welcome teams from the incoming Trump-Pence administration four years ago, gave them access to all that we had. And over the past few weeks, teams of genuine policy and management experts, many of them previous government experience who have gone into agencies across the government to conduct interviews with personnel, to uh, gather information, and to assess the state of the federal government, <coughs> excuse me, that we will shortly inherit. These teams worked under incredibly difficult circumstances, taking COVID-19 precautions and waiting weeks for the ascertainment, meaning that so they could go in and be clear, cleared to go in. But uh, they have done an outstanding job. For some agencies, our teams received exemplary cooperation from the career staff in those agencies. From others, most notably the Department of Defense, uh, we encountered obstruction from the political leadership of that department. And the truth is, many of the agencies that are critical to our security have incurred enormous damage. Many of them have been hollowed out in personnel, capacity, and in morale, in the policy processes that have atrophied or have been sidelined, in the despair of our alliances and the disrepair of those alliances. In our absence from key institutions that matter to the welfare of the American people. In the general disengagement from the world. And all of it makes it harder for our government to protect the American people, to, uh, to defend our vital interest. In a world where threats are constantly evolving and our adversaries are constantly adapting. Rebuilding the full set of our instruments of foreign policy and national security is a key challenge that the Vice President-elect Harris and I will face upon taking office, starting with our diplomacy. Today, we heard from the leaders of the state and USAID agency review teams about the critical early investment we're going to need to make in our diplomacy, in our development efforts, and in rebuilding our alliances to close the ranks with our partners and bring to bear the full benefits of our shared strength for the American people. When we consider the most daunting threats of our time, we know that meeting them requires American engagement and American leadership, but also that none of them can be solved by America acting alone. Take climate change, for example. The United States accounts for less than 15 percent of the global carbon emissions. But without clear, coordinated, and committed approach from the other 85 percent of the carbon emitters, the world will continue to warm. Storms will continue to worsen. Climate change will continue to threaten the lives and livelihoods and public health and economics of our existence and our, literally, the very existence of our planet. We've learned so painfully this year the cost of being unprepared for a pandemic that leaps borders and circles the globe. If we're going to, if we aren't investing with our partners around the world to strengthen the health systems everywhere, we're undermining our ability to permanently defeat COVID-19 
and we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to the next deadly epidemic. And as we uh, compete with China to hold China's government accountable for its trade abuses, technology, human rights, and other fronts, our position will be much stronger when we build coalitions of like-minded partners and allies that make common cause with us in defense of our shared interests and our shared values. We make up only 25 percent, almost 25 percent of the entire economy of the world. But together with our democratic partners, we more than double our economic leverage. On any issue that matters to the U.S. and China relationship, from pursuing a foreign policy for the middle class, including a trade and economic agenda that produces and protects American workers, our intellectual prosperity and the environment, to ensuring security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region, to championing human rights, we're stronger and more effective when we're flanked by nations that share our vision and the future of our world. That's how we multiply the impact of our efforts and make those efforts more sustainable. That's the power of smart, effective American leadership. But right now, there's an enormous vacuum. We're going to have to regain the trust and confidence of a world that has begun to find ways to work around us or work without us. We also heard from key leaders of our intelligence and defense review teams, including Stephanie O'Sullivan, former principal deputy director of the National Intelligence and retired Army Lieutenant General Karen Gibson. We talked about the different strategic challenges we're going to face from both Russia and China and the reforms we must make to put ourselves in the strongest possible position to meet those challenges. That includes modernizing our defense priorities to better deter aggression in the future, rather than, continue, rather than continuing to overinvest in legacy systems designed to address threats of the past. We have to be able to innovate, to reimagine our defenses against growing threats in new realms like cyberspace. We're still learning about the extent of the solar winds hack and the vulnerabilities that have been exposed. As I said last week, this attack constitutes a grave risk to our national security. We need to close the gap between where our capabilities are now and where they need to be to better deter, detect, disrupt, and respond to those sorts of intrusions in the future. This is an area where Republicans and Democrats are in agreement, and we should be able to work on a bipartisan basis to better secure the American people against malign cyber actors. And right now, as our nation is in a period of transition, we need to make sure that nothing is lost in the handoff between administrations. My team needs a clear picture of our force posture around the world and our operations to deter our enemies. We need full visibility into the budget planning underway at the Defense Department and other agencies in order to avoid any window of confusion or catch-up that our adversaries may try to exploit. But as I said from the beginning, we have encountered roadblocks from the political leadership at the Department of Defense and the Office of Management and Budget. Right now, we just aren't getting all the information that we need for the ongoing, outgoing, and from the outgoing administration in key national security areas. It's nothing short, in my view, of irresponsibility. Finally, we spoke about the day one challenge that we're going to need to address immediately, drawing on the skill sets of the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We were briefed on the steps needed to clean up the humanitarian disaster that the Trump administration has systematically created on our southern border. We will institute humane and orderly responses. That means rebuilding the capacity we need to safely and quickly process asylum seekers without creating near-term crisis in the midst of this deadly pandemic. These are hard issues, and the current administration has made them much harder by working to erode our capacity. It's going to take time to rebuild that capacity. We're going to work purposely, diligently, and responsibly to roll back Trump's restrictions starting on day one. 
but it is not as simple as throwing a switch to turn everything back on, especially amid a pandemic. We'll have to have a process to ensure everyone's health and safety, including the safety of asylum seekers, hoping for a new start in the United States, free of violence and persecution. Of course, an essential part of this will be managing the safe, equitable, and efficient distribution of vaccinations to as many Americans as possible, as quickly as possible. FEMA has an enormous, enormous part to play in this. And we heard from the former FEMA director, Craig Fugate, today. We want to make sure that our administration is poised to make full use of FEMA's domestic reach and capacity in managing our COVID response. And finally, from every briefer, I was heartened. I was literally heartened to hear about the incredible strength we'll be inheriting in the career professionals and working people across these agencies. They never stop doing their jobs and continue to serve our country day in and day out to keep their fellow Americans safe, just as they've always done. These agencies are filled with patriots who have earned our respect and who should never be treated as political footballs. I'm looking forward to the honor of working with them again, to asking for their advice and inputs to help shape the best possible policies for all Americans. I want to thank the incredible folks who've served on these agency review teams as part of this transition. They're, they've dedicated their time and energy, their vital experience and expertise to help ensure Vice President Harris and I are ready to hit the ground running. And we look forward to the start of a new year, fresh with hope and possibilities for better days to come, but clear-eyed clear-eyed about the challenges that will not disappear overnight. I want to reiterate my message to the American people. We've overcome incredible challenges as a nation, and we've done it before, and we will do it again. We'll do it by coming together, by uniting after years of pain and loss, a year particularly needed to heal, to rebuild, to reclaim America's place in the world. This is the work that lies ahead of us. And I know we're up to the task. We will champion liberty and democracy once more. We will reclaim our credibility to lead the free world. And we will, once again, lead not just by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. We've been watching President-elect Joe Biden deliver remarks on national security. The future president began the event by thanking first responders who responded to that explosion in Nashville on Christmas Day. At the core of his speech, the president-elect emphasized the importance of rebuilding international alliances. Mr. Biden said there is an enormous vacuum right now and that the U.S. has to regain the trust of the world. He says the U.S. will continue to face challenges from China and Russia and that the country must modernize and innovate against new threats, especially in cyberspace. Mr. Biden also called the Trump administration, quote, irresponsible for not being fully transparent with the incoming administration, in particular with regard to the Department of Defense. Uh, for more, I want to bring in Ed O'Keefe on the phone. He is a CBS News political correspondent. And uh, Ed, uh, obviously, the big headline here has to do with the Department of Defense. Were you surprised by anything he said there? No, and in fact, I'm beginning to believe, Chip, that this was less about getting actual uh, policy updates from these transition advisors of his and more designed to call out the Pentagon for doing what he called out there. We should rewind the tape a little bit to before Christmas when the Pentagon suddenly announced that there was a mutually agreed upon pause to a series of meetings that were going to be held between current Defense Department officials and the Biden team that they apparently, the Pentagon said, had mutually agreed to put off until after the holiday. But the Biden team almost immediately uh, clapped back and said, no, we never agreed to that. And by delaying these meetings, you are not, you know, holding up your end of the bargain and properly preparing the next administration to take over. There was word earlier today from our colleague David Martin that the Pentagon was still in that pause, that holiday pause, but that they were continuing to pass along 
information that had been requested by the Biden team, even if they weren't holding meetings. But you can hear there the president-elect saying that the Pentagon has not been fully forthcoming and also cited the Office of Management and Budget, which is not only the place that the budget gets written, but, of course, the one that serves as the clearinghouse for all policy across the administration and is sort of the keeper of all the details on things that are going on in every single agency and department. So if he's having issues there, uh, then that is a sign as well of potential political interference. And there have been some concerns among those that are closely monitoring the transition that there are a, a collection of political appointees in the budget office that have been sort of trying to, in essence, leave some people behind or try to find ways to dismiss career officials uh, for whatever reason, uh, using an obscure but important change in federal personnel law that essentially allowed them to uh, have a little more discretion over who's working there. So, you know, these are things that in the grand scheme don't necessarily uh, have, a, have a huge real-world effect unless or until they might down the road at some point. And that is what concerns the Biden team, is that if there is a slowdown in the information sharing, what are they potentially not being told about or what are they potentially missing that could suddenly become a concern later on? And so uh, that, to me, was sort of the main takeaway of all of this, is that he's calling out Defense Department officials for dragging their feet or at least not being as cooperative as he would like. Right. He, he actually used some pretty strong language there. He said obstruction initially, and later he said roadblocks uh, being put in the way of the uh, Biden team uh, at the Defense Department. He was very clear that these are political appointees. We're not talking about the generals uh, at the Defense Department. I assume we're talking about the Secretary of Defense and some of his underlings, and as you mentioned, some of the people at the Office of Management and Budget. Um, it, does this—do you get the sense— not not just from what he said here, but what, from people, from what people have said to you, that they really believe there are there are national security dangers being uh, created here by the uh, failure of the Trump administration to uh, cooperate in this exchange of information. Well, the yeah, the answer to that is yes, in the sense that there are unknown unknowns. To quote the former Defense Secretary Don Rumsfeld, you know they don't know <laughs> what they're not being told. And so if there is something that they should know about or that they're dragging their feet and sharing, you know, then that's, that's what's concerning them. We haven't heard anything specific. If this persists through this week, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to hear about something specific that's not being shared. And we have no idea if it has to do with Pentagon operations, if it has to do with the budget, if it has to do with specific military threats around the world that the Biden team is trying to learn more about. Uh, but obviously, remember, you know, there, there, while in some ways there is uh, sort of general agreement between the president and the president-elect on things like the need to draw down troops in Afghanistan, uh, you know, there are obviously bigger differences and concerns about the way the military has been used in some parts of the Middle East and other parts of the world, like the decision right before Christmas to withdraw a few hundred or reassign a few hundred troops uh, that were based in Africa to other operations as well. So they may be asking about things like that and not getting answers, or it may be something else. And remember, we're dealing with an acting defense secretary right now, Chris Miller, who was put in uh, after Secretary Esper was dismissed shortly after the election. So it could be that Miller either uh, is doing the president's bidding in this case, maybe doesn't entirely grasp the severity of the importance of sharing all this information. That's unclear. But to have it go all the way to the principal and have him sort of call out the current administration and say you're not helping us uh, is is the kind of thing that has concerned a lot of people uh, in the lead up to the election and in the weeks since the election that there would be uh, examples of this. They have been isolated so far. It was we were told, I've been told at least that the Defense Department, the Budget Office, and the Environmental Protection Agency really were the three places that stood out as places that were causing more angst or stress for the Biden team than they should, for whatever reason. And uh, today, clearly, the Defense Department and Budget Office getting called out. Uh, one quick last question, Ed. Do you, do you get the sense from talking to people in the Biden team teams uh, that this is coming from underlings, or is this resistance coming from the president himself? It would be coming from the president's appointed underlings, so the political staff, not the career employees. There's been no indication anywhere that the career staff or the people that stay between administrations who make it their life's work to work at these various places are causing the issues. It's, it's concerns with 
political appointees who either it may be from the secretary on down, maybe the people who work for the secretaries or the agency directors that are causing this. And it's often those aides who are responsible for this kind of back and forth between the current and next administration and the ones that are most loyal or most interested in causing trouble potentially. And that appears to be what's happening here. Okay, Ed O'Keefe, enjoy my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. Thank you very much.